Talent Acquisition. Besides that, she also serves in the Foundation Committee of Bauer Bayer Foundation. Please welcome her on stage. So hello, my first question is, um, who is a founder in the audience? And any investors in the audience? <laughs> okay, great. So I'm really excited that our panelists today um, represent uh, many stages um, in the investment and um, a founder's life cycle. So um, Zoe Fabian is Managing Director of Eurasio Growth, a one, a one billion growth equity fund of Eurasio, uh, which is an 18 billion um, fund um, with investment track, track record in Montclair, Farfetch, and Vestia Collective. Maria Spilka is co a co founder of tech company, <laughs> Mädchen Flohmarkt, in 2012 when she was 22 years old. So you're 30 now. <laughs> and um, you raised up to date, um, year to date, the 7 million euro. Yeah and are currently preparing your uh, next growth round. Halima Yarudi. <laughs> Halima is the founder of This Is Her, and she launched the company just last year, end of last year, and you're in the middle of fundraising your angel round. Exactly. Yeah. And there we have Jana Schafschwert. <laughs> Jana is the CFO on demand and active angel investor. Uh, you are also invested in lifestyle companies such as Strong Fitness Cosmetics. Yes. So, so um, I would like to start with the uh, like first uh, step in the founder's life cycle with the angel round. And also, uh, like Hal Halima, um, you founded This Is Her. So how did you come up with the idea? So basically, uh, I'm actually kind of new to the whole fashion industry. Um, I was working in consulting and was, uh, what it was advising like um, senior management in different industries and then you're always asked to, you know, kind of be properly dressed formal. <laughs> and I felt like that most of the money that I had was going into fashion that I didn't like and that I would only wear during the week because it was way too masculine. Um, the, the quality wasn't as great and whenever I wanted to own something that was more feminine but that I would still transition into my weekends, I would have to kind of upgrade and go for the big designers which was a, basically impossible. And then I basically owned two wardrobes which was a waste of money and of like basically resources in general. And well, after spending uh, some time, taking a break and spending some time in Paris, I decided to found this business with the idea of dressing women, professional strong women, into a more like more feminine uh, clothing because I believe that we don't have to be dressed as men to be taken seriously when in business, which unfortunately when you look at like all these traditional brands that are established still happens because they're taking this like male powerful outfits and then just like downgraded for women. And um, you, were, you were born a founder or what was your, what did you do before? <laughs> like, uh, did you have a business track record? Yeah. Just how, how? So most probably not born because I'm <laughs> way too old for it. It would, be, would have been great. So um, basically what happened is um, I was in strategy consulting and I knew that I wanted to be, you know, I have a, have a successful career, travel the world and all that stuff. So I did that for a few years and I advised companies in different uh, sectors, oil and gas, automotive, and also fashion, and this whole like questions around like strategy, how to grow the company, and also did um, some cases for like restructuring for NKD, a fashion discounter that was struggling, um, and then also for Esprit. So I did, I did different like consulting projects, um, but just on like what I just said with NKD and um, Esprit while doing the projects, there was this crash of Rana Plaza. So um, this is also something that actually educated me or like informed how I approached this whole venture of this is her, like how do I actually want to establish a brand? Do I want to produce for like these costs and exploiting people along the way, which unfortunately mm -hmm. still happens with like established brands. So no, no, you're now um, starting your fundraising round. How much money are you raising? So we're actually raising a small round of 500,000 um, and it's a small angel round. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so there's the angel, Jana. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how do founders best approach you when they want to get angel money from you? So, what's and uh, how did you become an active angel investor? By well, I'm also CFO on demand, so um, I actually work very closely with startups in their fundraising round or when they consider fundraising or um, uh, going down uh, the road of looking for business angels. So they usually approach me for getting feedback on, on, uh, on their, their setup of financials or setup of pitch decks and storytelling. Um, and um, I start working with them, give them feedback, and then I actually get a really good feeling of like how the, do the founders work, what is the setup, and of course, dive right into the numbers. So that's actually a good advantage for, um, uh, for a business angel to be that, that close already in the project and to the founders. And this is usually how it evolved. Um, also with, uh, with Strong Fitness Cosmetics was um, a client of mine actually to, in two touch points two years in a row. Um, and then I said, okay, you, you, you developed super well. Um, you have the right spirit as a founder. And that's uh, why I said, okay, I'm, I'm taking the risk and going in there as business angel as well. Um, and what is important for you as an, an angel investor? Um, what you see in a founder which makes it a very good investment for you? Because at this very early stage, yeah. angel stage, I mean, usually there's not a product, there's often an idea or just a first traction. Mm. So what are KPIs, key performance indicators for you, which make it a good Im investment? Well, first and foremost, the, the founder spirit and entrepreneurial spirit of the founders is super important, especially in this phase, because you, you don't have any like long history and a lot of numbers to show. You usually right at the beginning of, of tracking your numbers. Um, then I'm, of course, numbers driven. So if you know your numbers and know what comes out of your product, let's say what's on a gross margin level, what are the unit, unit economics in terms of I'm making this amount of revenue, let's say, and then I have to do marketing to get that order and I have to produce the item to, uh, to ship it and I have shipping costs. So know what's coming out of your, your one sale uh, bottom line. Um, that's super important. And um, especially if it comes to uh, brand or uh, um, um, uh, like um, uh, investments that, that uh, or products that uh, have to build up a, a huge brand, you have to know your target customer. Um, so be very precise in who you want to target. And that's actually something that I, um, that I miss a lot. So uh, uh, that, um, especially in the first phase, founders are very insecure about what, who they want to target. Of course, you didn't do your, um, a lot of tracking. You do not have lots of orders to really show um, what, are, what is your target group. But if you can narrow it down and um, do a precise step-by-step -step, um, approach in marketing, knowing your customer is so, so, so important. And that's actually um, uh, also key for me if I look into investments. How how, how securely can you say, or how determined are you, and how well do you know your market and your customer? Uh, talking about steps and by steps, so Maria, you are now, um, I mean, the company, you raised some million. So what were your first steps with Metinflow, Mark? And also speaking about what was your target group. So what did you do that you got that amount of money here mm. today? Um, so we choose uh, the pathway um, to first build a proof of concept, um, which was a very, very simple um, prototype version of, of the product we, we envisioned. And we um, launched this prototype, and um, it, it was actually a, a huge success from day one. So um, product market fit was not our challenge um, from beginning on. Um, our challenge was then to, to, build a, to build a viable product. And, um, and in terms of, of fundraising, um, I, I think we um, did some mis a lot of mi mistakes also at, at the beginning. Um, so we, we were approached by the first um, professional venture capitalists, I think, in our um, maybe first three months. And um, actually, we... Um, um, we pitched to them, 
and we realized we were not ready. So we hadn't figured out our um, numbers, we didn't know the, the funnel. Um, it, it, was, it was a huge mistake because we never got a second chance. So um, if, if I um, can give you some advice from, from my experience, I would, I would advise you to first get your numbers, um, to, to know your business model, and um, maybe not pitch to the um, AVCs um, from beginning on. You should, you should <laughs> get some training, um, maybe with some B or C um, choices, just to know all the questions they're coming up with, to have the answers to them, and then approach the, 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 um, the VCs you, you want to work with. You now have a very prominent uh, family office from a retail um, company as an investor. Uh, what is the advantage um, for having those um, traditional um, companies as an investor versus a VC? And what's your tip for our founders out here to approach these families? Um, so, um, I start from, from your last question. So, how, how did we approach them? Um, it, it was just on occasion. Um, we, we went to a um, pitching event, they went to a pitching event, um, we, we sat near them <laughs> and we, we got to talk. So um, it was just an occasion. Um, for us, um, this was a really great um, validation of our business model um, because um, we already have had um, a venture capital firm invested in us. They could relate to our business model because they had also similar um, um, businesses in their portfolio, but to get the validation of a um, fashion industry player was um, very meaningful to us because, you know, we, we have to our business model, we have a logistics part. None of my co-founders um, nor I have a logistics background. So everything we did by, by the time, we had just thought up in our minds. And it was really great to have like a huge multi-million retailer looking at your processes <laughs> and saying, oh, we did this uh, similar <laughs> a couple of years ago. And um, so we learned a lot. Um, then surely they, they have a very strong network. Um, this, this helps also a lot. Um, and, uh, and they also have a very different understanding of our product and our vision. So again, like the, 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 the VC guys, and to be honest, they are mostly male. Um, when we pitch to them, they ask their wives. And um, <laughs> what, what are the wives of the VC guys? Um, I would say they are, they are um, Vogue material. Our, our product is, is not for the Vogue customer. So many of the VC guys could not relate to our product. And um, this, um, this was different, yeah. So speaking of very, very, very large growth rounds, um, Zoe, um, thanks for having time today. Um, I know you have a very busy schedule. So you're managing director of Aura Zero Growth the One Billion Growth Equity Fund of Aura Zero Group. Um, can you explain us and tell us a bit more about the whole uh, fund? Sure. Um, so first of all, I think what makes us really special is that we're quite female, just because you mentioned that, so we have a female awesome. CEO. Yeah. <laughs> but beyond that, so we're diversified. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah. pass that along to her. <laughs> um, we are a diversified um, investment company, essentially. So we have 18 billion under management. We have 250 people globally um, with a headquarter in Paris, with a big office in New York, an equally big office in Shanghai, and then spread across Europe, obviously in Berlin, um, but then also Frankfurt, London, and Madrid, and expanding also. And um, I, I think when I say diversified, it's really true that we can and aim to work with companies along the whole kind of stages of development. So from the er very early seed and venture stages to growth equity, which is what I'm doing, and there we have the equity part. Um, we also have growth debt, um, so we're able to get into the different situations uh, along the growth stages, and then up to private equity, which typically are majority transactions. And so typically we then build um, relationships with founders very on. I'm actually always very happy when I'm approached early. It's true that I appreciate if somebody is very thoughtful about the business model and understands the economics, because 
you know, I'm not the expert, obviously, so I'm, I'm a fiduciary of capital, so I have to make sure that I allocate capital into the right hands, and obviously it builds trust if you know your numbers, but I'm happy to build relationships on the long term and actually also always proud to see people evolve. Um, sometimes I make the mistakes of not investing and then I, I, I know better, but sometimes you, you meet early on and then you, you find into a partnership uh, later on. So Orazius invested in some very prominent fashion companies like Farfetch, Montclair, or Vestia Collective. Um, when did Orazio invest in these companies and uh, what made these attractive to Orazio? Sure. So um, the first one in 2011 was Montclair. I'm, I'm sure you, you, you all know the brand with the down jackets. And um, this was um, done out of the private equity arms for majority investment uh, at the time. Um, just over 900 million in equity value when they IPO'd in 2013, already much higher. And then when we sold ultimately our stake, they were at almost uh, 10 billion uh, euros of value. So within the eight years we worked together, um, they actually grew tenfold in, in value. And I think that's what um, we got very excited about. I think initially why we invested um, a very strong brand, a strong product, but not yet um, living up to its full potential. So we worked a lot together with them to actually identify and address growth axes. And for them, it was the US and it was China. And to actually develop these markets, um, build up a, a retail network, which by then they didn't really have. So actually move away from wholesale and get into their own retail, which was highly successful for them. And um, yeah, also building up uh, other products. Although I have to say that this one was just to also share not only always what went well, but also what was the challenge is to actually diversify the product strategy. So I think what we learned is to really straight, stay true to your core focus. I think Halima is being very smart at focusing on, on one product and perfecting that. And I think what we learned here is that also you have to stay true to your product category. So um, speaking of Farfetch and Montclair, so uh, Montclair, as I said, uh, when uh, the performance went very up after the IPO, and um, but I think the performance of the Farfetch IPO um, in 2018 it's not going so well. So um, what's going on there? So what are you? What's your reaction as an <laughs> investor then? I mean, as an investor, our reaction is that we're not only an investor, so not, we're not only in it for the money, but we're also a partner. So we actually continue to be invested, and we're um, still happy with the returns that we make um, on that investment. So we initially invested in 2016 in Farfetch, and, 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 and just to, to share what we got excited about is essentially the fact that they build a very strong value proposition to the different customers they essentially serve, right? They work with the boutiques and give them an incredible reach, which they wouldn't have had if they would just operate locally. Um, obviously, for a customer, it's great because you get access to a, a very curated type of inventory, very nice pieces um, that you would, wouldn't have access to on the normal e-commerce sites. And then ultimately, for brands, it's, it's a way to give brands control back, right? Because brands always struggle when they actually list it in, 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 in general e-commerce. Um, obviously, they run into the risk of not being able to control the discounts, the messaging, the branding, and so on. And so with Farfetch, they're completely in control. And, and this very strong value uh, proposition along with the underlying unit economics was something that we got very excited about. And to be honest, we still see it. Uh, and the growth um, that they're delivering is really, really impressive. So it's been 50 to 100% growth on the different KPIs we're tracking. And it's continuing to be that. Unfortunately, capital markets sometimes are inefficient or are not that smart and are maybe um, not um, as long-term oriented as we are. So we're very comfortable staying invested and are sure that um, the value is going to um, get to its fundamental level again. Okay, thank you for that insight. So speaking of brand and first KPIs, I mean, Halima, you are really basically bootstrapping and to build some traction for your first round. So um, can you recommend the strategy for first-time founders? Um, so I don't know if I can... I mean, I, I don't have hindsight experience to say, well, I would recommend it, but I just can tell you what my approach is and why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I believe that there is um, enough money in the market and that there is like, um, there is potential to also like raise money without having a product or just having an idea. But uh, my own 
um, expectation was just to be able to build a product first, to test it with the market, to see is the target audience that I am thinking of my actual target audience, or and is the product that I'm designing for the market, is it actually something that the market wants, or uh, before being, you know, kind of receiving feedback, checking if there's a product market fit before I go out and um, ask money. So there are two reasons why I'm doing it. First, obviously, a uh, kind of security, safety, understanding, and being confident enough to understand and to say, I, I definitely know that this product and this concept and this venture works because I've already tested it. But then also it increases, obviously, credibility and valuation once you go out and raise funds because you can already show, hey, this is what I've achieved over the past month. Um, I have like a, I've built a community of really strong women that are all embracing my products. Um, I've built operations, which is also not that easy, right? To find someone to like a production side that manufactures to the quality that you want and to have all that kind of set in place. So um, I did it also because I wanted to have a proper valuation and be able to negotiate once I raise money and not be like, oh, I really need money. So I basically give you 30%, just give me 200K, kind of. So this was the logic. I generally think it's a more, um, a more risky approach, obviously, and it's also an approach that you basically go to, to, well, not the nicest phase, to be honest, because it's all of your own money. It hurts more spending your own money than spending some, someone else's money, I would say. Um, then it's obviously you have to cut down on your own like kind of living standard. Um, which also wasn't that easy because I was coming out of consulting, working for the Boston Consulting Group, earning enough money, you know, having a decent lifestyle. So it was also like, in general, I think it's a risky approach and not the nicest. But I believe that, uh, you know, afterwards, what you get out of it is just like, I mean, that's what I'm betting on is so much better. Uh, Jana, um, I think what would be very helpful for the audience and for first-time founders is to understand different stages of um, investments. So, what are because we had some names like Angel, VC, um, mm. Seed, um, Growth. Um, can you maybe explain to the audience a little bit what and also the, the the levels or the ranges of money invested in these rounds? So. Well, the level of money is invested in each of these rounds clearly depends also on the business model or an industry you, you're talking about, but usually you would say, if you talk about an angel round, it's usually something that you said around 500K um, uh, up to maybe a million. It depends on what the setup's going to be, um, how many business angels you want to approach, because if you approach business angels, um, they're rarely business angels or super angels who invest more than 200, 300, 500K at one go but you would have a setup of business angels, let's say 50K here, 50,000 um, uh, euros here, or up to 100,000. This is usually the case that I see if we talk about angel, business angel rounds. Um, so you approach your very close network um, uh, and uh, less institutional investors or investors. Um, then the next round is usually then already in, in, in its millions, two, three, up to five million sometimes, and this is the moment where you actually have to go out to go to uh, institutional investors, financial investors, meaning venture capital firms, who are specialized in, uh, in so-called seed or series A rounds, um, uh, being the first to, sometimes actually the first to actually go and dig deeper into your financials. Um, which business angels sometimes um, not do that thoroughly enough or because there's not much there yet, um, you have a different investment approach. But venture capitalists work with external money or foreign money. So you have to understand their approach of investing and their approach of um, eliminating as much risk as possible for their own investors. Um, and this is why they... Um, uh, they have to uh, see all of your financials, a lot of tracking, a lot of numbers, um, which is the basis that needs to be there. In the end, I wouldn't say always that's the main trigger to invest eventually, but they have a checkbox of potential risk that they want to eliminate in that phase, um, and that's mainly revolving around how much do you get 
um, out of one euro of sales in the end? Um, and how long would it take to actually cover up any, any other fixed costs that you have in terms of personal, et cetera? And understanding the main trigger of scaling your business. And uh, this is like, then after Series A, of course, you have B, C, D, all those rounds uh, up to an IPO, and all those rounds just get, keep getting bigger then. So, Maria, um, I mean, how big is your team now? Um, around two, 200 people. Okay, when you have a team of 200 people and are doing your growth round and um, have these big operations, what are your tips for founders out there to manage both the <laughs> round and the operations, the people? <laughs> um, so, how we do it, I, I don't know if it works for everyone, we, 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 split, um, we split our um, 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 focus, so I have, I have two co-founders and basically um, one or two of us are keeping the, the operations uh, running and one of us is running around and pitching to investors and um, um, yeah, this, we did this from, from beginning on and um, it, it helps, but um, yeah, I, I, I think it, when you're really just starting your, your business, um, it's really difficult because <laughs> it's so much to do um, to, to keep up with everything. Yeah. But you, you manage. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's probably for us in our face the biggest challenge because we're a very tiny team. As I mean, it's bootstrapped, so we can't pay like five or ten people. And that's like the biggest challenge of like knowing that now 50 or 60% of your time you have to actually really allocate it to like fundraising because otherwise what happens is like you never meet your plans because you spend too much time on like the whole, you know, managing operations. And, and you know, there, there is a saying, um, after the funding is before the funding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it so, never ends. <laughs> so your business model with Metin Flomarkt is a very sustainable um, uh, bus uh, business model with uh, like uh, giving back to the fashion life cycle. How much relevance does sustainability has um, when it comes to the investment side, when you see companies with that? Sure. I mean, for us, I would say it's very important, but it's also increasing. I mean, obviously, we have our LPs or our investors, limited partners, and our funds very focused on it, and I think rightly so. Um, we have um, a company with a similar business model in our portfolio, so we have Vestiaire Collective with a different focus, mm -hmm. right? So their focus essentially on a C2C marketplace in the luxury space, and we got really excited about it because we saw... Um, basically, again, the value proposition, right? Uh, sometimes you buy more expensive things that you actually would like to hand over to good hands. Um, and there's a real virality in their business model, which makes marketing costs go down and actually the whole business model being very profitable. So that's what got us excited. But beyond that, it's the circularity of, 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 of basically or their purpose in terms of having a circularity in the system that generates huge amounts of profits for some firms um, and uh, a lot of expenses on the other. And I think these are very valuable goods that are actually being produced and they deserve a second life. So we get very excited about that. And so it's definitely something we're, we're looking at very closely. Last question to you, Zoe. Um, what's the next big thing in fashion tech from your investor perspective and what makes a great founder? <laughs> so two questions. <laughs> um, I think on kind of what's the next big thing, I, I, I would not call myself a fashion expert, so um, I'm probably more on, on the technology or digital side of, of, of things. And I mean, obviously, there's a couple of things that we see repeatedly coming in terms of deal flow towards us. Um, we spoke about circularity, something we find very interesting, because oftentimes it's combined with asset light business models, something that we feel like we can be helpful with. And then there's a lot of direct to consumer uh, approaches, very interesting ones that probably merit another kind of capital partner, but very important ones. And then obviously there's a lot of um, innovation also going on on the supply chain and, and production side, but again, not really up our fairway, but at